Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Christ Lutheran. Today we are, you know, in the end of church year, the second last Sunday of the church year, and today we then celebrate a wonderful victory of that Jesus has supplied for his church. We call it the Saints Triumphant. May the Lord bless us as we gather around his word, and may he then also use that word in our hearts to continue to equip us and keep us waiting. May the Lord bless us as we gather in his word. We'll begin with this first hymn. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. 
Lord God Almighty, so rule and govern our hearts and minds that by your Holy Spirit we may always look forward to the end of this present evil age and to the day of your righteous judgment. Keep us steadfast in true and living faith and present us at last holy and blameless before you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson today is recorded in the prophet Isaiah in the 52nd chapter. This uh, section of Isaiah is actually spoken in the future for, about, for people that are going to be living, the, the intended receivers, about 200 years after Isaiah. But yet Israel was already going through the problems and troubles that afterwards would be delivered with the Babylonian captivity. But at this time yet, the kingdom of Israel that was north of Judah was also in place. And the Assyrians had not yet uh, taken away the, the northern the kingdom. And what Isaiah was telling the people is how they needed to repent and to return to God. And of course, you know, that's what the Bible points out. And I guess it's really not any different today. Nobody's listening. And the end result was going to be Israel was going to be lost. But then, but now then also Judah was going to be eventually and then taken into uh, almost 400 years later into captivity in Babylon. And now Isaiah has a message for those people who are living in Babylon. And actually it's an, a message that also applies for us today. It says, Awake, awake, Zion, clothe yourselves with strength. Put on your garments of splendor. Jerusalem, the holy city, the uncircumcised and defiled will not enter you again. Shake off your dust, rise up, sit enthroned, Jerusalem. Free yourself from the chains on your neck, daughter Zion, now a captive. For this is what the Lord says. You were sold for nothing, and without money you will be redeemed. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. At first my people went down to Egypt to live. Lately Assyria has oppressed them. And now what do I have here, declares the Lord? For my people have been taken away for nothing, and those who rule them mock, declares the Lord. And all day long, my name is constantly blasphemed. Therefore, my people will know my name. Therefore, in that day, they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson is recorded in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians in the fourth chapter, where the apostle is giving this encouragement to us, a wonderful and tremendous encouragement, to know that we have that eternal victory that Jesus has supplied for us. As he says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind. We who, are, who have no hope, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. We confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Holy Gospel for today, is, which is also the sermon text, is recorded in Matthew in the 25th chapter, where Jesus is, continues to teach about the end of the world. And today, the, the point of this story is really that preparation for the wonderful invitation that we've received. 
to the wedding banquet of the Lamb. And he says, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, there's a neat story that, uh, that comes from the Appalachians that, you know, that in in Kentucky, you know, the Appalachian, well, the Appalachian forest is huge in the, on the eastern coast, and if you've ever gone there, Dan, and, and in Kentucky, part of, the, part of the forest, in the national forest, there's all kinds of, you know, well, there are not a lot of them, but there's cabins where, well, uh, well mountain, mountain men live, and they're in isolation, they're by themselves. And one of these guys had the name of Quill. And he grew up there. He knew the woods better than the game warden did. And because he was self-sufficient, he figured, well, why in the world should I have to go into town and buy a license? And he didn't pay any attention to the fishing license or getting that and the fishing regulations in the same way with the hunting ones. He was just using what was for him, you know, what he needed and didn't see any reason to, to buy a license. But the game warden, you know, wasn't impressed and didn't agree. And so he was always trying to catch Quill. And no matter how, Quill, because he knew the woods so well, he always got away. Never could catch him. One day, the game warden got an idea. He thought, I'm going to sit on Quill's roof, crawl up there at night, and then I'll be able to hear when he leaves and goes down to the lake. And then I'll be able to follow him. And I'll follow in a distance and hide behind the trees and stuff until Quill's got his big illegal catch. And I'll nab him. Well, everything, the plan was going well. He spent most of the night on the roof of Quill's cabin. And then in, when it was just about dawn, he noticed that Quill was starting to stir, and then that he got his cook stove ready, or was, you know, was making something, and pretty soon he could smell the coffee, and then he could smell something was baking. Ooh, hot biscuits. Ooh, they smelled so good. And by this time, of course, you know, he was pretty hungry being up on the roof. And after a while, Quill, came out on his front porch and he yelled, you might as well come down and eat these while they're hot and enjoy the coffee. I know you're there. He goes back in. Well, the game warden, oh, now he got caught. What's he going to do? Stay up there would be futile. So he comes down and Talks, and as they're talking, he invites them in, and they were visiting, and he was, you know, talking over stuff. And the game warden finally asked, how did you know I was up there? And Quill responded, I didn't. 
But I figured that one of you guys would try something like that for a long time. And every morning, I would go out when I had the biscuits done, go out and yell, come on down. <laughs> and sure enough, I was right. You know, see now, Quill was prepared, wasn't he? And that's really the point that Jesus is making here in this story. That point of how important it is for us to be prepared. Because when you think of it, we have in our possession one of the greatest invitations that could ever be issued in the whole world. We have the invitation to attend the wedding banquet of the Lamb. And what Jesus is pointing out here, and really in a very, I guess you could say, a really kind of small way, he's talking about, you know, it, like this one, you can say if we wanted to apply the story to ourselves, that you and I are the attendants for the wedding. We are, we're asked to come and appoint and lead the bridegroom, or the, yeah, the bridegroom to his bride. And so we have that opportunity. And when you think about it, that's really what we have, isn't it? That continued opportunity to keep on waiting for the bridegroom to come. But in Jesus' story, he's pointing out, though, that God's plans are not our plans and God's ways are not our ways. And this is really obvious. Who in the world starts a wedding at midnight? Hmm? Well, now, of course, it would be illegal, wouldn't it? <laughs> but in, there, in that day, of course, it isn't. And that's when it starts. Whew. Midnight? Who in the world would expect that? Well, both the prepared and the unprepared didn't, did they? All of them were, well, waiting all day. Well, who knows when they came there? Probably in the afternoon sometime and waiting now into the evening. <sighs> yeah, they're going to get tired and they fall asleep. But like Jesus said, five were foolish and five were wise. You know, when you think of the world today, there are quite a few people, and this may sound judgmental, but it isn't really because this is what God's word is telling us, that they think they're really ready for Jesus' coming. Well, first of all, there's a bunch of them that won't even believe that that's ever going to happen. But those that, that, well, maybe think, well, maybe there is. But then how do they think that they're ready? Well, yeah, they're good people. They're not really unbelievers, and they kind of look to God, and they, and they, well, they pray once in a while, and and you know, lead pretty good lives. They're ready, but then the cry comes, and now it's time to trim the lamps. And here too, this is a really a very important picture that we as Believers need to remember what enabled those wise virgins to enter the wedding. Yeah, they could trim the lamps, but then also they had the wine, that, or the wine, the, the oil that they needed to, for the lamps to rekindle and to keep burning. The foolish ones didn't. But you see, now it was too late to go and share the gospel, like, you know, the oil with them. And remember that, you know, when you think of the scriptures and how, and many times, how many times don't they use faith as, you know, the, uh, the importance and really faith showing in our hearts and is like a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. So how do we keep that lamp light burning? And how, what do we need to do? And that's really what Jesus also is implying here with this, to be those wise virgins, bringing that extra oil along. 
by being firmly grounded in the Word of God. You know, and when the cry comes, we don't know when it's going to be. But you see, it's only those who have that faith that's been nourished and strengthened by the Word of God that have been, and have been, that, that so then even if they fall asleep. And this is, you know, and it's, it's interesting that this, you know, that Jesus uses this picture, especially then now in connection like with the second letter or the second lesson the, in, in Thessalonians. Part of the reason Paul wrote that letter to the Thessalonians is because a number of the Christians in that congregation got the idea that Jesus was going to be coming back at any moment. And that's what we still teach, don't we? And that's what the Bible says. He could come back at any moment. And that's in our way of counting time. It's way past midnight, isn't it? Well, in Paul's day, there were Christians that felt that way too. And they got the idea then that, oh man, what happens to those people who die before Jesus comes back? And there were actually those then that taught, oh, it's too bad. They missed out. They aren't alive when now and Jesus is coming. And that's why Paul says to them and reminds them, you know, like what he said, you know, of the days and times, I don't need to remind you. And then you notice, because as he says in verse 16 there, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And so what this story then is really also pointing out is the importance of, yeah, we fall asleep because it's midnight. But in our lives too, when now Jesus doesn't come before midnight, we're going to fall asleep too, aren't we? Only the word calls it death. And so, yeah, it would look like we're unprepared. But you see the importance of falling asleep with faith? That's it, isn't it? And in fact, as Paul points out there too in Thessalonians, yeah, for those who have closed their eyes here, where are they? They're with the Lord. Yeah, their bodies aren't there, but their souls are. But then the bodies are going to rejoice in that last day too. And they're not going to miss out because what's going to happen? The trumpet call and the dead will rise and all of the believers, both that were alive at the time or those that have now gone ahead, have preceded us, are risen and up there before the Lord. You know, that's why... You know, in, in Revelation, you know, chapters 19, 20, and 21, John was, you know, given that tour of heaven and of the future from Jesus. And the angel that gave him now this tour of, of the, the last day, judgment day, the angel told him, right, blessed are the dead, or no, blessed are those who have been invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. He said to them, these are the true words of God. And you see, that blessing, the angel making that point of John writing this, was also a reminder to us. Yeah, the stuff that's going on in this world is crazy. And... It just doesn't seem to make any sense whatsoever. And even though mankind thinks he's gonna, they're going to save themselves with science or with their knowledge, we know that's not going to do it. But we know the one who has. And that's the one who has invited us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's just a wonderful, beautiful picture of that eternal victory that Jesus has supplied for us. And that's something we can rely on no matter what's going on. 
Yeah, even as, unfru- and as uncertain as the futures may seem, one thing we know, our God is still in control. And our God is still the one who's ruling all things for the good of his people. And that we can trust on. And it's maybe good for us to listen to Isaiah's call. Yeah, we need to awake. Because look at the promise. At the time, Jerusalem was still in existence at the time when Isaiah wrote those. But there was going to be a time when Jerusalem was gone. And those Babylonian captives there realized, boy, the temple is gone. The city of God is gone. But what did Jesus say or the Lord say? You were sold for nothing, but you're also going to be redeemed. You're going to be bought. And that's what we are. And now we possess that wonderful invitation. And you see, it's God's word then that keeps us equipped and waiting. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We pray. Lord of eternity and King of kings, all the heavens adore you. Saints and angels sing before you. We too join them to praise your majesty. You clothe us with garments of righteousness. You bless us with grace and mercy in this life and eternal glory forever. What undeserved love you show us. We thank you, Lord, that you have made us your saints. Encourage us by your gracious promises. Forgive our failures to live as you desire. Strengthen the faith of all who are weak and wandering. Give us the power to live as your faithful people through your word. Your saints will triumph forever in new heavens and a new earth. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. We anticipate with joy an eternity of perfect fellowship with you. Be with us as we work and witness for Christ so that many more people can join us before your throne. Lord of life, the day is coming when you will come down from heaven with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. On that glorious day, the saints triumphant will rise in brilliant array, clothed in your perfect righteousness. Give us strength until that day when we will share fully in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us, Lord, in your name, and hear us too as we pray in his name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Amen.